Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University Co College of Arts and Sciences, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Vanessa Klo, and I serve as the college's director of alumni relations. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for our alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with IU and the College of Arts and Sciences during this time when we are unably, unable to easily connect in person. Before we begin tonight's program, I'm excited to announce that the college is kicking off a celebration of the enduring legacies of our alumni over the next academic year. Our Celebrating Alumni Contributions 200 Plus Years of Impact initiative will highlight the contributions of our alumni have made to their professions and their communities and to the university. In addition to weekly social media alumni spotlights, we will host a special series of events like tonight's discussion for alumni community, in addition to marquee virtual events with alumni dignitaries. Please follow us on social media and watch our inbox for an official announcement about this special year of celebration. With that, I am pleased to introduce tonight's featured speaker, Professor Jessica Colarco from the Department of Sociology. Professor Colarco's research examines inequalities in education and in families, health and well being, with a focus on how privileged people use their privilege to gain and maintain an unfair advantage over others. Following her presentation, Professor Clarka will be joined by Department of Sociology alumna and PhD candidate Maritza Steele. Steele's dissertation research, which is sponsored by the National Science Foundation, examines the relationship between discipline and student learning environments in elementary school classrooms. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion or during the moderated Q&A. Simply click on the questions tab located at the bottom of your screen. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Jessica Colarco. Thank you so much, Vanessa. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I am certainly um, excited uh, to have a chance to talk with you about all of this research uh, that I'll be sharing this evening, uh, which was conducted before the pandemic, um, but which unfortunately has tremendous implications uh, for IU students um, and IU faculty and IU staff as we move through this pandemic right now. Um, and so let me share my screen with you here. So I'll be talking today about the digital divide on college campuses and, and specifically as it relates to equity and, in, in, and inclusion uh, during the transition to online instruction uh, that we're seeing this year. So it's easy to look around a college campus and essentially think there's no digital divide here. Students are constantly on their laptops or their cell phones to the point where some college professors have opted to even do things like ban digital devices or relegate them to certain corners of the classroom. At the same time, and despite the ubiquity of technology, my research with Amy Dunn and Teresa Lynch suggests that today's college students are still very much divided along digital lines. We find in our research that I'll talk about this evening that some of our most vulnerable students, low-income students and students of color, are less likely to have access to the kind of reliable digital technology that they need in order to be successful online. We also find that students with more limited access to reliable technology tend to get lower grades in college and also report significantly higher stress levels, even when campuses are operating normally. And so along those lines, I'll tell you a little bit more about the research in a minute, but based on what we found, I, I'm worried that if instructors and university officials don't proceed carefully, that this current pandemic will ultimately have a huge and exacerbating impact on the inequalities that already exist uh, between students at IU. So to tell you a bit more about the research, uh, the study that I mentioned involved more than 750 undergraduates at a large Midwestern university. Uh, we started with focus groups asking open-ended questions, uh, and this was conducted in 2014 and 2015, so pre-pandemic, um, but I, I'm hopeful that the, um, the results that we found can at least speak to the challenges that existed before the pandemic and are certainly likely to be exacerbated now. So we started with focus groups asking open-ended questions about students' experiences with technology and the challenges that they face in maintaining access to the internet, 
and to digital devices like laptops and tablets and smartphones. The focus groups, we divided them socioeconomically based on students' family backgrounds so that we could get a better sense of students' experiences and concerns and how those varied uh, for students from different income or socioeconomic groups. There were about 25 students who participated in the focus groups, which each lasted about two hours um, and covered a wide range of topics related to students' technology use and their experiences on campus more generally. We then used what we learned from the focus groups to develop a detailed survey about college students' experiences with technology uh, and the role that those experiences play in reinforcing inequalities in school. And as an aside, that survey actually was used recently as the basis for a survey that was conducted here in Bloomington to better understand uh, in digital inequalities that exist uh, among community members. Um, and they're uh, recently putting together some results from that as well. And so we've been excited to see how uh, the questions that we developed for our own survey, which were some novel questions, not only about access to technology, but access to reliable technology, uh, how that's being pushed out into the community and used there as well. So we offered the survey in introductory courses on campus, and we had uh, 748 undergraduate students take the survey. And then we used the data from the surveys and from our focus group conversations to be able to understand which students are struggling to maintain access to reliable digital technology, the kind of technology that they can actually count on to get their work done for class? And then how are those struggles related to things like students' grades and mental health in college? And then how do those struggles contribute to larger patterns of inequality that already exist on campus, particularly in relation to student socioeconomic status, as well as to race and ethnicity or patterns based on sort of longstanding histories of of racism uh, that exists in our country. And in these models, we controlled for other factors that are likely to impact things like students' grades and students' stress levels, uh, things like students' age and how long they've been on campus, uh, their, race, their racial and ethnic backgrounds, their parents' income, uh, their financial aid status, year in school, um, all of those things that might also influence uh, their technology access and certainly their education and health outcomes as well. So let me talk you through some of the key findings here. So first, we find evidence of inequities in students' access to digital devices. Certainly most of the students in our sample, this was an online survey, and so we weren't surprised to find that most of the students in our sample had access to a smartphone or a laptop. Uh, but those access numbers were higher for students who were affluent and white uh, than they were for students from more vulnerable groups, from uh, students from low-income backgrounds and students of color. Low-income students and students of color, we found, were also more likely to share a device, uh, to not have their own laptop or their own cell phone, but instead to share one with a roommate or a family member, which, thinking in the context of the current pandemic, could make things more difficult now that students are doing more of their coursework online. Uh, the students who participated in this project were all taking on-campus classes uh, at the time of the study, and so we can think about how if they were pushed to do all of their coursework online, that could have implications if they have to share a device with someone else. Compared to their more privileged peers, low-income students and students of color were also more likely to be living off campus as opposed to on campus and less likely to have access to Wi-Fi uh, where they lived. Because of that, many students from marginalized groups in our survey uh, were relying on things like cell phone data uh, when they weren't on campus and they often ran out of data minutes uh, before the month was up. And so again, we can think about that in the context of the current pandemic. If students are having to participate in synchronous classes, um, and be able to uh, watch that live video, that is going to eat up a much larger chunk of their data every month than they were likely using uh, pre-pandemic. And those students are often bearing the costs, as I'll talk about uh, next. So these problems in access in, in part reflected the fact that low-income students and students of color were much more likely than affluent white students to be responsible for all of their own technology-related costs. Affluent white students in our sample relied heavily on their parents for financial support in college, uh, not only for tuition, but also for technology costs. Their parents bought them laptops and cell phones, paid their monthly cell phone bills for them, and paid to have their devices replaced or repaired when they broke. Uh, one of the questions that we asked on the survey was, if your device became unusable, how long would it take you to replace it? And overwhelmingly, the affluent white students in our sample said I would basically I could get it replaced within a day or two. I would just, and then in focus groups, they would tell us, oh, I would just call mom and dad, or they would tell me to put it on the credit card, and it would be replaced within a day or so, uh, and they'd have a new or functioning device. 
Students, for, students of color and students from low-income families, on the other hand, generally paid for all of their own tech. They bought their own laptops or sometimes got old hand-me-down laptops from friends or from family members. Uh, they paid for their own cell phones and they paid their own monthly cell phone bills in most cases. And so because of those cost differences or those differences in who was paying the costs, that led to inequalities in the reliability of the tech that students owned. Essentially, because they were the ones who had to pay the costs of technology, students from marginalized groups, they had laptops or cell phones at all, tended to have older, slower, more broken, and less reliable devices. In focus groups, for example, these students told us about having laptops with missing H keys, that they couldn't ever type the letter H. They had to go and copy and paste it from somewhere else anytime they wanted to type the letter H. Um, or laptops with batteries that, that wouldn't hold a charge. Um, so that they couldn't actually take them to class with them or move around or go to public places that they had to be tethered to an outlet. Uh, phones with screens so shattered that they couldn't reliably answer phone calls, which in some cases led to missed opportunities for work shifts or in one case almost a missed call with a law school dean. And so and they also talked about things like cell phones running out of data halfway through the month, as I mentioned before, or in some cases, devices, especially laptops, that were so old and slow that they couldn't run the programs that they were supposed to use for class. And so essentially, because they had and relied on less reliable tech, students of color and students from low-income backgrounds also experienced more frequent and longer-lasting disruptions in their access to technology. Uh, in our focus groups, low-income students, for example, told us about laptops and phones that, that created almost daily frustrations, uh, even before classwork was mostly being done online. They told us in some cases about going weeks or months without a functioning device and about having to borrow a friend's laptops to write their papers or to, to take to class with them uh, because their laptop was just too glitchy or too frustrating to use. So they technically had a laptop, um, but it was often not as reliable as they needed it to be. Meanwhile, and because they could rely on their parents to pay for their devices, affluent white students had devices that were newer, faster, and more reliable. Uh, certainly, those students occasionally had problems with their devices. Oftentimes, that was things like broken screens or trouble connecting to the Wi-Fi. But those disruptions rarely lasted more than a few hours, and those students, as I mentioned before, could easily rely on their parents for help with fixing or replacing devices that became unusable. So unfortunately, our research suggests that these inequalities in the reliability of students' access to technology have real consequences, even in situations like pre-pandemic when universities are operating normally. We find, for example, in our research that students who experience more frequent and prolonged problems with technology also report lower grades in college and higher levels of stress uh, than students who don't have those same frequent and prolonged problems with technology. And so essentially what that suggests is that even before the current disruptions that we're seeing during the COVID-19 pandemic, technology-related inequities were already contributing to inequalities in students' grades and mental health. And certainly I would argue that those unequal consequences are likely to be felt even more acutely in this current moment with so much of students' coursework uh, being conducted online. So along those lines, and, and to give you a better sense of what those challenges look like in real life, let me tell you about two of the students uh, that, that took part in our focus groups. Uh, they call themselves Sam and Jimmy. They got to pick their pseudonyms. So Sam and Jimmy were both seniors in college at the time at IU, and uh, both were highly motivated students. But Sam was from an affluent family, whereas Jimmy's family had much more limited resources. Like most affluent students, Sam owned a laptop and a smartphone, um, and both of those devices were relatively new and problem-free. For example, when Sam cracked the screen on his iPhone, he called his parents right away. And he, as he told us, I mean, they weren't very happy about it, but they let me get a new one. It just took a couple days. They pay for all my phone stuff. Now, that broken cell phone screen was the worst tech problem Sam had experienced in all four years of college. And it only took a few days to resolve, and it had almost no impact on Sam's schoolwork, on his stress level, or on his life more generally. Jimmy, on the other hand, had numerous ongoing issues with technology. 
Uh, Jimmy, for example, started his freshman year with a hand-me-down laptop, uh, but it died almost right away. He told us, I had a paper due for this class I had to take, and I did have my laptop at the time, but it completely died on me. Like, I couldn't get it to start. It completely overheated on me, and I hadn't saved the paper anywhere else because I didn't know better then, and I didn't have a smartphone, so I had no way of emailing the teacher. I didn't really know what to do, so I had to talk to the professor the next day, the day the paper was due, and they weren't cool with it. And I pretty much lost all the points on that paper. They gave me like 20% when I turned it in a few days later. So after his laptop broke, Jimmy couldn't afford to buy a new one and he couldn't ask his parents for money. And so as we saw in that scenario, he uh, ended up having to go to the teacher, go to his professor and say, hey, look, I'm having this problem with technology. And that was another thing that we found in our research. We asked students about how comfortable they felt going to their professors to let them know if they were having problems with technology, and then also how they thought that their professors would respond. And one of the things that we found was that low-income students uh, were much less likely to say that they were comfortable going to their professors to acknowledge uh, that, there were, um, that they were having problems with technology. Uh, and then they also reported that they didn't expect, they were, much like, less, they were much less likely to say that they thought that professors would be receptive to those requests. And we asked them a sort of open-ended question saying, so why do you think that would be the case? And whether you said, yes, the professor would be responsive or no, the professor would say no to those kinds of, I, my, my laptop broke or I'm having problems with technology and I need an extension or I need some extra help. Um, why do you think that they would or wouldn't be responsive? And essentially what the low-income students told us was that in the past, they've been treated like Jimmy had been treated here, that the professor maybe gave them 20% of the points or maybe just told them you should have done a better job dealing with technology in the first place or you're a college student, you should have a reliable laptop. And so because of that, because of how students had been treated in those kinds of interactions, they were less likely to trust their professors, to trust their faculty members to be responsive uh, when they were dealing with the kinds of technology disruptions uh, that they more often faced uh, than their more privileged peers. And that's consistent with other research that I've also done pre-pandemic, uh, looking at elementary school students and middle school students um, and their differences in their comfort level, uh, asking for help and acknowledging when they're struggling in the classroom. Uh, essentially what I've found in that research is that there's a huge trust gap uh, between students from different socioeconomic backgrounds uh, with more privileged students feeling more confident and more entitled in the classroom to support and accommodations from their professors, from their universities, from their schools as a whole. And so essentially it's important to keep in mind um, as students are dealing with these kinds of problems that the students who are experiencing the most challenges related to technology may also be the ones who are least comfortable asking for help. Sorry. Hey buddy. I have to do a talk right now. Can I come in in a little while? I'm sorry, bud. I'll see you in just a little while, kiddo. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, this is why I'm out on the porch um, with the birds, unfortunately or fortunately. Uh, so anyway, so like Jimmy, as we heard in this story, so Jimmy didn't have his own devices, didn't have these reliable devices, and uh, ended up in a situation where because of that, he, like many of the other low-income students in our study, uh, relied heavily on campus resources, especially on campus computer labs. After that laptop of his uh, broke during his freshman year, he never got a new one. Uh, instead, for the, for the remainder of his college career, uh, he continued to rely heavily, often spending uh, over 10 hours a week uh, in campus computer labs. And so, Certainly, it is, it is great that campuses like IU are able to provide those kinds of public resources for students. Uh, but those resources also have limitations. Now, for example, that students are being expected to complete more or in some cases even all of their coursework online, it's not clear that there are enough of those public resources to go around. As we know, for example, clustering in public spaces, places like computer labs or libraries also increases the transmission risk of COVID-19. And so that means that because of the digital divide, because of their li more limited access to reliable technology, uh, students from marginalized groups in many cases may have to make the decision about whether to put their lives at risk if they want to be able to get their schoolwork done. So ultimately, and because of these digital inequalities, we can't assume that all of our students and especially our most vulnerable students will be able to complete the work that they're supposed to be doing online this year. 
And we also can't expect that the course policies and procedures that we might use in normal circumstances, things like mandatory uh, attendance or timed exams or proctored exams, uh, or even grades at all, possibly. And uh, that's something we can certainly talk about in the q and I've been um, using an ungrading model in my own classes uh, this year, and that's something I'm happy to talk about if you're interested. We have to be questioning whether those standard course policies and procedures are equitable now, if they ever were at all. And we have to be mindful about the unequal health burden uh, that students might be facing right now in trying to get their work done for class. Uh, for example, if uh, students uh, have to uh, come to campus in order to access their resources, if they have to physically be in in-campus spaces, whose health is that putting at risk if some students have access to their own personal devices and others do not? And so this also raises the question of, so what do we do? How should we address these kinds of inequities and inequalities that we're seeing on college campuses and that existed before the pandemic, but are likely to be even more consequential now? So certainly giving every student access to a reliable personal device and reliable at-home internet would be a huge step in the right direction. And that would allow students to have the flexibility, no matter whether courses are in person or on campus, uh, to have the technology that they need, not only during these particularly challenging times, uh, but also for the long term as well. At the same time, and for public schools like IU, the costs of that kind of program serving 40,000 undergrads across the state of Indiana would be huge. Short of that, then, I'd argue that we also need to think about how we can approach this current crisis uh, from a faculty and institutional perspective with as much empathy and equity as possible. So what does it look like? What, what would that look like to close the empathy gap on college campuses? Broadly, and, and I'm happy to talk in more detail about any of these in the Q&A, offering resources and support. Essentially, faculty and administrators should be taking steps to make as clear and accessible as possible for students uh, how to access the resources that exist on campus, locally, and nationally. Uh, and that's not only technology resources, uh, things like access to uh, low cost internet programs, though those are far too difficult uh, to sign up for and require far too much paperwork and far too many hurdles. Um, also resources related to mental health. Uh, there have been uh, data recently released by the CDC showing shockingly and, and dismayingly high rates of um, anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation among young people in the wake of the pandemic. And so we have to be helping students to connect to those resources on campus and locally and putting more resources into those resources for students as well. And then also at the faculty level and the university level, adjusting expectations, being reasonable about what kinds of work can get done and what counts as success during a pandemic. That might, for example, mean things like getting rid of traditional grades or traditional exams and rethinking whether those are the right solutions uh, for students in the wake of a pandemic. Is it fair, for example, if you have one student who is uh, taking an online exam um, in their bedroom quietly by themselves with perfectly reliable access to internet on their brand new um, Apple uh, laptop uh, and another student who has to take that same exam, maybe from her car in the parking lot of a McDonald's with two young kids in the back seat the whole time because that is the only place that she can get access to reliable Wi-Fi and she doesn't have access to childcare uh, because her childcare center is closed during the pandemic. And so we have to think about, is that fair? Uh, are those two students being given equal opportunities? And is it fair to grade them both on the same scale? We also have to think about making universal accommodations. Essentially, as I was mentioning before, the students who often need the most help with technology and more generally in school are often the ones who have the, the least amount of trust in institutions and, and deservedly have the least amount of trust in institutions. And that can make it difficult for them to acknowledge and to not feel like they are being a burden or not feel embarrassed about needing the help that they need. And so the more that institutions and individual faculty members can give students access to the support and the resources and the flexibility that they need without having to ask, uh, building in uh, accommodations, building in flexible assignments, um, offering classes both synchronously and asynchronously for those students who are dealing with challenges that make it difficult for them to join synchronous class meetings right now. 
uh, building those into the structure of courses can go a long way in, in helping students to uh, better navigate the digital divide. If you have a student, for example, who is sharing a laptop with a classmate, if they both have the class or with a with a um, not necessarily with a classmate, but with a, or with a roommate or with their sibling, they and they have classes that they have to take at the same time, then they have to make hard trade offs about uh, whether or not uh, who gets to go to class that day. And so by offering courses asynchronously, uh, we can help to ensure that all students can get the material uh, that's being presented this semester. And then also granting individual flexibility. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've strongly pushed for this semester is for faculty members and instructors uh, to get to know their students, even if they're teaching them online. I've created some resources that I've shared on Canvas and on social media, um, including surveys, kind of beginning of semester surveys that faculty can use to ask some of the similar questions. And then instructors can use to ask some of the kinds of questions that we asked in our research in order to better understand the challenges that their students are facing right now um, so that they can better put in place the kinds of supports that students will need uh, without having students have to come to them and ask individually for help. Faculty will know upfront uh, what kinds of challenges their students are likely to be facing and hopefully uh, be willing to redesign their courses or at least be flexible in their requirements and in the assignments that they're offering and the kinds of assessments that they're using for students uh, this semester as well and not forcing students to jump through hoops and prove that they need those accommodations. When we know with certainty that so many students right now are facing the most difficult and challenging and, and uprooting times uh, that they've experienced in their lives. So essentially, and of course, the, the specifics of how we adjust our expectations for students and for courses will have to vary across different disciplines, across different campuses, across different classes, across different instructors. Uh, but essentially what I'm arguing here is that in this moment of transition, if we want to reduce the chances that this COVID-19 pandemic will exacerbate inequalities on campus and inequalities in society for, for years to come, then we have to shift not only the way that we teach our students and not only the resources that we give to our students, but also the expectations that we set for students in that process. And we have to ensure that those expectations reflect a high level of equity and empathy, especially toward those students who are most vulnerable uh, during this especially dis difficult and disruptive time. So with that, I see that there are a number of questions in the Q&A in the chat and in the chat. I'm going to turn things over to Maritza. I'm going to turn off my screen share here. Um, though certainly I encourage you all to, to keep in touch with me. I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter and, and social media. Um, you're welcome to check out my website um, or drop me an email if you have further questions that we're not able to answer tonight. Uh, but I'm so grateful that Marissa is able to be with us tonight. Uh, she is, um, as Vanessa mentioned, she is a, a stellar graduate student uh, here in the sociology department in Bloomington, also the recipient of a National Science Foundation graduate research fellowship, uh, which she's used to spend the last uh, two years doing a, a really in-depth and innovative ethnographic and interview study looking at uh, both how children learn about race and ethnicity in the classroom and also at how teachers behavior management management strategies uh, impact students in rural elementary schools uh, and so i will turn it over to maritza um, in order to um, ask some of the questions that you all have posed uh, and, and thank you for sharing those as well Thank you, Professor Calargo. That was wonderful. We've had a number of questions pop up here. One of them is about the idea that IU or other universities might offer a technology class to bring students up to speed on uh, how to use technology in college and perhaps different strategies that are useful. And so my question for you is, have you seen any prevalence of this in the university setting? And what kinds of things would a class like that address that you would recommend to help students bridge this gap? Sure. And so, I mean, I think there, there is some really good research on students' technology skills and how those are stratified by uh, socio socioeconomic status uh, and by race and ethnicity as well. Matt Raffalo is a sociologist who works at Google, uh, who's done some research on the way that schools uh, with different demographic profiles differently police or encourage students' use of technology. And he finds, for example, that in af primarily affluent and white schools, students are actively encouraged to use technology as part of learning as early as elementary and middle school. Uh, whereas in schools that primarily serve elementary and middle schools that primarily serve uh, lower income students and have more students of color, 
um, in many cases in those schools, students' use of technology is highly and tightly policed and strongly discouraged by teachers and not treated as something that is part of the learning process. And so certainly those students, they, he, he talks about this concept of digital play. And so certainly those students, they learn digital play. Uh, most students, if, if they've grown up with a cell phone, if they've had access to the internet, uh, do have a, a basic familiarity um, with using technology and, and often being very creative with technology. Uh, but what's often um, more discouraged among students of color and, and lower income students in, in the schools that they're attending for K-12 um, is actually seeing how technology can be integrated into learning. And so I would say that if a course like that were offered, I mean, I think first and foremost, the, the, the inequities in access are, are the most important thing to address. Um, that making sure that all students have access to the kinds of reliable devices uh, that they need in order to be successful is sort of the, the, the first and foremost priority. Uh, but then once students have those devices, certainly it could be helpful to help students see, to learn some of the basic uh, technology skills that, that faculty members often take for granted. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of coursework, and I'm not sure that a sort of general technology class um, might be the, the most useful because the technology skills that students need vary so much across different disciplines. I think, if anything, what I would encourage is for um, in, in some of my other work, I talk about this concept of the hidden curriculum, which are is essentially the things that students are expected to know, uh, but are rarely explicitly taught. And so the hidden curriculum varies across different disciplines. Um, and so uh, faculty members in, in writing intensive courses, for example, might expect that students uh, will come to college with the ability to craft an essay uh, that has an argument and uses evidence and knows how to cite that evidence, uh, when in many cases students have never been taught to do that. Um, and may never have been taught to use kind of word processing software um, in ways that supports writing in a constructive um, and sort of college ready kind of way. And so for those kinds of courses, you might imagine technology courses that help students and kind of integrate how to use technology for writing. And similarly for classes for, for departments that are more stats heavy or more math heavy, um, helping students building in the technology and helping faculty members and instructors to sort of um, start by addressing their own assumptions about the technology skills that students often bring, that, they, that they're expecting students to have, and then saying, well, let's assume that students may not all have those technology skills. So how can we make sure that there are places within our department for students to gather to get those kinds of technology skills that are necessary uh, for the kinds of coursework that they'll be doing within a particular field? Thanks. Great. And so thinking particularly about this year, where we have a whole class of incoming first year students who are experiencing college for the first time, mostly online, what kinds of challenges might that bring that are unique to starting out college in such a way where maybe they don't have the same support resources that they otherwise would? Absolutely. I think this is a, a tremendously challenging time for especially students from more vulnerable groups, for students from low income backgrounds, students living in rural areas that may not even have reliable access to the internet. Um, in many parts, there was a study that was done of K-12 students in, in Indiana that found that 85,000 students, K-12 students across the state just don't have access to internet at home. And many of those students live in rural areas where it is not cost effective for internet service providers like Comcast uh, to lay cable. So it is just not possible uh, for those students to get high speed internet access uh, where they live. And so thinking about the, the, the tremendous need that we have for um, digital infrastructure, uh, for public investment in digital infrastructure to support those students, uh, for students who maybe they, they came to campus and they tested positive for COVID and they, they would have preferred to go back home and live in a place where they were comfortable, live with their families, live with their support networks, especially this, this at, in such a difficult transition, but they were forced to move into the quarantine dorms instead uh, because they otherwise had no access to internet at home. And so we can think about how tremendously traumatizing that would be for a first year student to show up on campus um, and end up in that kind of a situation. And so I think there's, there's whole hosts of challenges uh, that students uh, from vulnerable backgrounds or, or students who are especially vulnerable right now are, are facing as they transition, especially during that first year of school. Uh, we could also imagine how much more difficult it is. We know how difficult it is for students from low income backgrounds and students of color to seek help uh, when they are struggling with problems on campus. And we can imagine that with, without the availability of in-person um, support structures 
uh, or, or the more limited availability of in-person support structures, how much more difficult that's going to make it for students to feel connected to their faculty members, uh, to uh, their classmates, uh, to uh, re key resources on campus, whether that's uh, CAPS or to student advising um, or to other groups that are um, intended to support students through this time of difficult transition. Um, but who students might have more trouble reaching out to uh, because of the digital, the digital inequities that they're facing right now and the, and the lack of face-to-face -face, um, opportunities as well. Thinking about from your own experience and your research, talking to these students and then perhaps your own experience in academia, how receptive are faculty and particularly at Indiana University to the idea that they need to build trust with less, less affluent students? I mean, I, it's, I don't think I have hard numbers on how common that kind of an approach might be. Um, and certainly in my own experience as a faculty member and in talking to students, I think there is a, a hugely wide range of different opinions about the way that faculty should interact with students and the level of um, the level of trust that faculty should extend to students as well. Um, and oftentimes when faculty engage in punitive practices, having harsh attendance policies, or uh, using things like um, strict exam proctoring rules, or um, other types of punitive policies that we might imagine in the classroom, harshly penalizing students for late uh, submissions of assignments because of technology problems, that oftentimes that comes from a place of not trusting students, um, and also a place of privileging a version of academic rigor um, that assumes that the students who, that, that sort of puts a high level of weight on a, a view that success in college is meritocratic, um, that, that students who do better are the students who work harder, uh, when research consistently shows us that that is not at all what's happening, that there are huge differences in the resources that students bring with them to college, um, in part as a function of the kinds of uh, opportunities that they had in the K-12 schools that they attended before they got to IU and in part because of the additional inequalities that students might be facing um, as, they, as they leave K-12 schools and come to college as well. And so we have to think about how, and I've done a, a number of webinars um, over the past few months in the, in the wake of COVID-19 and I've been heartened to see so many IU faculty um, being responsive to these kinds of messages, uh, talking about these digital inequities, talking about other types of inequities that students are facing with respect to things like hunger and homelessness or challenges related to childcare uh, or challenges related to uh, uh, students with disabilities and trying to navigate new environments on campus. That there's a whole host of challenges that students are facing right now. And, and I have been heartened to see how many IU faculty have shown up for those kinds of webinars, been receptive to those kinds of messages, uh, and even been willing to consider pretty dramatic shifts in their own teaching. Uh, things, considering things like uh, not using exams and finding alternative ways of assessing students or considering things like ungrading. Uh, ungrading, to give you a, a, a taste of what that, that means, it doesn't mean not giving student grades. Um, it, what it means instead is that students' grades are determined through a conversation, uh, sometimes a digitally mediated conversation through text between the faculty member or the instructor and the students. Uh, essentially, students provide self-assessments the way they would often be called upon to do in the workplace, uh, where they are self-evaluating their own learning and their own contributions, and then submitting that to the instructor and saying, here's the grade that I think I deserve for the work that I've done in the course so far. And then the faculty member the, or the instructor has the opportunity to then ask questions uh, about that self-assessment uh, that the student has provided and then make a decision whether to accept that or not. Uh, and essentially what it does, especially when instructors build in lessons about how to self-assess, uh, it can provide students with a valuable set of skills that they will need in the rest of their careers where they will often be called upon to evaluate their own contributions to an organization or to a learning team or to a a work team, uh, while also making sure that the, the faculty member or the instructor is fully aware of the effort and the work that students are putting into the class, as opposed to using arbitrary or often biased measures uh, to evaluate students' progress instead. And so I've been really, um, to get back to the original question, I, I've certainly been heartened to see that there is, does seem to be a growing interest and a growing awareness of the need for those kinds of um, 
alternative policies and alternative practices, uh, especially in the wake of this pandemic. But I, I'm hopeful that some of that momentum will continue beyond the pandemic as well. So you've mentioned things such as ungrading and different types of assignments that might be uh, better suited for online learning. Can you give some examples of how faculty might adjust their expectations or their course policies to better facilitate online learning and perhaps some of the ways that you've done this in your own teaching? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the key things is to give students as much flexibility as is reasonable uh, within the parameters of the course. Uh, so for example, with, um, with my own classes, doing both synchronous, having both uh, synchronous and asynchronous options. If you're going to have a, a, a synchronous class, making sure that you have ways to uh, record those discussions and make them available to students who are not able to attend in person. I think that's beneficial um, in, in the times of COVID and not in the times of COVID in that we know that we have students who are always dealing with um, illness or the death of a family member or other challenges in their lives that can make it difficult for them to show up for class. And the more that we can help students get access to the material and participate on their own time, uh, that's helpful in the long term as well. I think getting rid of things like graded attendance, um, that if you're going to be holding synchronous classes, being mindful or at the very least offering students uh, flexible attendance policies where they don't have to prove that they were sick or prove that they had a valid reason to not show up for class on a particular day. I think also giving students some flexibility around the types of assignments that they do. Uh, you might be mindful, for example, that group work uh, may be especially challenging uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I typically, so like last spring, for example, when we had to sort of rapidly shift uh, to online instruction. I teach a large 250 student uh, introduction to sociology class and uh, one of the capstone uh, projects for that course is a, 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 an assignment where all of my students work in news teams to make podcasts about a social problem um, that is uh, confronting the IU community. Uh, and so having to pivot at the last minute, because it, it, it was very apparent that, that forcing students to complete a group project uh, when they were not supposed to be of uh, physically proximate to each other uh, was going to be deeply problematic. And so coming up with alternative assignments that students create in, uh, for students to do instead that allowed them to either do group work to, to, to finish out their podcasts if they'd already gotten far enough along that that, was, that that was reasonable, or for those students who weren't able to do that, developing an alternative assignment where they could essentially write a COVID diary, uh, where they were reflecting on the sociological concepts uh, that we had discussed in class, and then applying the sociology it sort of has this idea that uh, human lives are shaped by a combination of biography and history. Um, it's sort of who you are and where you are uh, in, in context. And so encouraging students to uh, write diary entries instead that reflect on sort of the social context that they are in and who they are within that social context to, um, to, to pull in the course content, but also gives them the chance to reflect on their experiences during uh, an incredibly tumultuous time. And so to the extent possible, giving students that kind of flexibility, having assignments that can be completed either individually or as group work, um, and with exams, for example, uh, not doing timed exams. Uh, I mean, I kind of like the um, student in the parking lot uh, example that I mentioned before, um, giving exams and giving especially timed exams right now to me feels um, problematic. Uh, and so it's something I've, I've long done for students is to uh, make exams essentially open book um, and to write questions that are more critical thinking questions um, and that, that are less about sort of just regurgitating knowledge than about applying information. Um, and so I think to the extent that faculty members are um, willing and able to rethink the way that they assess student learning uh, in the wake of this um, and, and to create options that are not going to penalize students uh, because of the challenges that they are facing and at the same time not privileged students uh, because of the, the lack of challenges uh, that they may be facing during the pandemic as well. Great. And then you've mentioned as well, and you've talked about in your other work too, challenges that individuals might um, face in just terms of the actual access to broadband and to Wi-Fi, particularly in rural areas. And so thinking about those kind of issues and those being things that the university cannot necessarily fix, what kinds of programs or assistance can the government or foundations, um, how can they step in to better help solve that issue? Absolutely. I mean, I think things like the rural broadband problem is something that has to be addressed with federal money. Uh, we have to essentially treat internet uh, like a public good, uh, the way that we treat a rural phone service and mail delivery, uh, in the sense that this is an essential public good 
uh, that all people need to have access to. It's not cost effective, as I was mentioning before, for private companies to run cable to those rural areas. There simply are not enough subscribers in those areas uh, to, make it, to make it cost effective. And so that is a clear place of a public goods problem where government intervention is absolutely necessary uh, to make sure that families and, and students in those communities have access to the digital resources that they need to be able to participate in online learning, whether that's at the college level or the K-12 level. Um, and so uh, that is, is one kind of clear place uh, for government involvement. Even here at I, I mean, certainly there are things that IU has been doing, and I can see a couple questions in the chat to this end, uh, sort of what are some things that we've seen happening here at IU. Um, one thing that, that um, in order to serve some of those students um, in, in more rural areas, um, IU was able to provide uh, personal hotspots um, to a number of students ac across the state at, at both the Bloomington campus and at other campuses, and also to some uh, staff members uh, and to faculty as well who live in more remote areas and who often are more low income faculty or staff members on campus um, and who did not have access to the internet necessary at home to the high speed internet access necessary at home to be able to offer courses online. Um, and so for those students and faculty and staff members, um, IU was able to provide uh, a limited number uh, of, of these personal hotspots um, that uh, use cell phone or cellular internet as opposed to um, cable-based internet um, instead. And so that was a, a tremendous benefit, um, but a limited one. And that's the kind of place where with an investment of federal money or private money, um, IU could certainly expand that kind of offering for students and make sure that all students have, that need them have access to those kinds of devices uh, when they're taking courses um, online to make sure that students have access, uh, not, not here, and also make sure that, that instructors, in many cases, especially graduate student instructors, uh, who may have uh, relatively low incomes and who may be struggling to, to, to cover their own costs during the pandemic, uh, making sure that they have the tech that they need to be able to provide those classes uh, as well. So thinking of my own experience as a graduate student who's taught my own class and also been a teaching assistant, the types of training that I received prior to the pandemic didn't really address online learning. And so I'm curious from that perspective, how can we better prepare instructors as we're teaching them how to be instructors to address inequalities in education and particularly this digital divide, especially looking towards the future where we might have a lot more remote learning. Absolutely. I think building this into, I mean, certainly the Preparing Future Faculty program that we have that's, that's often run through the sociology department here at IU is a tremendous resource uh, for uh, associate instructors to help prepare uh, current graduate students as future faculty members to uh, address the kinds of challenges that they face in the classroom, not only pedagogical challenges, uh, but also how to uh, address uh, inequities in the classroom and to raise instructors' awareness of the kinds of inequities that they may inadvertently contribute to uh, through the kinds of policies or practices that they develop in their courses. I've also been heartened to see a, a, a large number of um, webinars that the, that the university is offering um, in the wake of uh, the death of George Floyd and the protests that we've seen across the country in Breonna Taylor uh, and, and kind of reflecting on this moment of uh, racial inequity and racial injustice uh, that we see in our society and encouraging and, and providing instructors um, with tools to acknowledge and understand uh, the impact of racism on our society and in their own courses. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that, and I've, I've seen large numbers of, of attendees in those kinds of webinars and also in some webinars that I've offered around other types of inequities that students are facing uh, on things like the digital divide um, and other types of, of challenges, especially resource related challenges uh, that students are dealing with right now. And, and so seeing large numbers of instructors and faculty participating in those gives me hope um, that we can build that in as a normal part of uh, the curriculum uh, for graduate students who are learning to become the future instructors at IU and at colleges and universities across the country, that these are things that need to be um, sort of baked into the curriculum and not left for individual instructors to sort of come to and figure out on their own. So there's been a question about when this kind of disadvantage begins. And you've done research starting in elementary school and through uh, middle school and K-12. And so just based on your research and your understanding, um, really when does this disadvantage begin and how can we um, try to resolve it earlier in students' education? Absolutely, I mean, these inequities between families exist even prior to birth. I, I mean, there's sociological research showing that birth outcomes are impacted by socioeconomic status and by exposure to racism. 
Uh, and so really the inequalities in students' lives uh, start as early as we can possibly intervene. Uh, and really it shows the, the necessity of intervening as early as possible and making sure that all families have access to the resources necessary uh, to, to, to live without worrying about putting food on the table or a roof over their heads, without worrying about being exposed to persistent racism uh, or systemic violence. And so thinking about how uh, large scale shifts in the social structure would be necessary to, to, to fully eliminate the kinds of inequities that we see on college campuses because they start so early in students' lives and are then reinforced by every school system that students encounter uh, along the way to getting to IU. Uh, we know, for example, that the K-12 system of education is deeply unequal. And that's in large part because of the way that our system of K-12 education is, is funded and structured in the US. Uh, the vast majority of school funding uh, for public K-12 schools comes from local tax dollars. And so what that means is that for students who are living in more affluent areas, which because of systemic racism are disproportionately white areas, uh, those students have access to better funded K-12 schools, the kinds of schools that are able to offer computer labs, that are able to have uh, AP classes, uh, that are able to have uh, large numbers of guidance counselors and, and college counselors that can help students apply to college, uh, that can help um, them navigate uh, internships, even in high school, uh, to be able to prepare them for success in college and in the workforce later on. Those deep resource inequalities at the K-12 level then directly translate to the kinds of inequities that we see on campuses like IU uh, with students coming in with vastly different preparation. And, and we have to think about, is it, is it fair to grade those students uh, against each other, especially if we're grading on things like a curve? Um, is it fair to privilege the students who've gone to the high schools that had the AP classes, that had the extra tutoring, the parents who could enroll their kids in robotics camp and send them to all sorts of extracurricular activities? Um, should those students get the A because of the resources that they've come to college with? Um, or should we think about other ways to make sure that we are equitably assessing students uh, given the sort of lifetime of inequalities that they've um, experienced and encountered across uh, before, even, before even coming to IU? So then thinking about students once they're in a university setting and they're struggling with these issues, you have the student from your focus group who had a paper written and then the computer crashed and they weren't able to even contact their professor and ended up getting only 20% of the points eventually. Those types of experiences can be very disheartening. Um, what is your anticipation of how that might affect retention rates for these students? Mm, yeah, and there's, um, there's definitely some research on that as well on how um, digital inequities can not, not only push students out of college, but even prevent them from getting there in the first place. Um, in the sense that we know that there is, um, What's, what's sometimes called the summer melt, um, which is the, essentially there's a gap between the students who get into college and the students who often, who actually show up on campus in the fall. Um, and those students disproportionately are uh, students from low income backgrounds, students of color, um, and oftentimes it has a lot to do with uh, the logistical hurdles involved in registering for classes, in kind of getting the paperwork necessary and figuring out how to find housing on campus and, and kind of jumping through all of those logistical hurdles. Um, and, and there's a, um, a terrific book called uh, The Making of a Teenage Service Class uh, by Renita Ray, who's a sociologist at uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, um, that follows a group of uh, low-income students of color through, uh, they're, they're all high achieving students in, in, in high school, uh, and they're all the kind of students that their, their, their uh, teachers are sort of excited to try to send to college. And out of, I think, the 20 or so students that she was following, only one or two ended up actually making it into a four-year college uh, because they faced so many hurdles along the way. In some cases, um, not having a laptop and having to go to the public library to fill out all their college applications. And then when it came time to actually like pay the tuition bill and register for classes, they were like, I don't want to spend 30 minutes on the bus to have to go across town to get to the library to log in to do all this work to, to, to actually get in and it and just ended up not going. And so we can think about how those same, so certainly for the students who, who make it here, uh, they may be more privileged to begin with in terms of uh, technology resources or technology knowledge, but we could certainly imagine how a student like Jimmy uh, having that many setbacks in college and, and having that many frustrations with technology that it could certainly contribute uh, to the lack of 
um, persistence uh, that we see with students over their over their college careers and who, who is pushed out um, and who is ultimately able to to finish their degrees. We have a number of attendees who are curious about what IU is currently doing, particularly the administration, to try to bridge this divide, and in particular, perhaps how you would like your research to be used to address this. Sure. I mean, I think it's one. So, like I mentioned before, the the Wi-Fi hotspots were a big program that was put into place in the spring, um, in terms of trying to make sure that those students who um, needed access when campus closed uh, had access to internet, and those um, kind of. It, demand for those has kind of fluctuated now that students are back on campus here. Um, and there have been initiatives, IU um, did a survey of, of students, in part informed by some of the research that I talked about tonight, um, asking students about their access to devices and their access to internet. Uh, and what they found was that roughly 10% of students, uh, of IU students um, across all campuses don't have access to internet at home. Um, and so we can think about it uh, system wide. That's a huge number of students uh, that are potentially at risk um, if campus has to close or if they, for health reasons, are unable to come to campus um, or feel uncomfortable doing so given the health risks of being on campus right now. Uh, and so uh, those kinds of um, those kinds of data, uh, gathering those kinds of data are critical to understand the scope of the problem. Um, also putting out uh, resources through CEDL through the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. Uh, for faculty members and for instructors who are working to um, incorporate some of these ideas in their classes and in the way that they restructure their classes, um, encouraging faculty members and instructors to um, survey students using the survey that I, would, that I was talking about before, making that available to all instructors on campus as a, mod as a module that they can easily implement in their classes to better gauge the kinds of challenges that uh, students are experiencing in their own classes and then uh, providing tons of resources for instructors uh, to be able to design their courses as effectively as possible, including sort of hands-on support um, with technology. Uh, and certainly UITS, University Information Technology Services, uh, has been uh, working tremendously hard uh, to be able to provide support uh, to students and to faculty and instructors and staff who are uh, scrambling to figure out new technology platforms who are encountering problems with Zoom or problems with Kaltura and making sure that all of those systems run as smoothly as possible. I think, I mean, certainly it would be wonderful if IU could ensure that um, all students had a reliable laptop uh, to be able to do their work on. I think the costs involved in that kind of a program, uh, given the financial constraints that IU is currently under in the wake of a global pandemic uh, with pressures on uh, with a lack of federal funding, uh, with, with the, the CARES Act providing only sort of minimal funding for higher education and certainly not the kind of funding that we need in the wake of a global pandemic. I think it is very difficult to ask IU to try to come up with additional resources for a massive program of that scale. It would be wonderful, uh, but it would take lobbying efforts. It would take efforts to demand additional funding from the state and additional funding from the federal government uh, to make sure that IU is in a position to be able to uh, provide those resources to students um, kind of on a, on, a, on a widespread level as opposed to on a more case-by-case -case basis um, in, in the case of things like the hotspots where we had a number of them donated through um, through Sprint through a, a contract that IU has with Sprint so that that's where those um, those came from so it wasn't something that the university had to go out and, and find money to pay for. So I think in my experience um, in academia both at IU and my undergraduate uh, institution, there are a number of faculty in the majority, I would say, who really do care about these issues and really want to help their students. And so thinking about your colleagues now who are in the midst of the semester, a lot of them perhaps teaching online for the first time, who perhaps already have their assignments and their syllabus made up in a certain way, and they're experiencing these troubles with students not having access to technology. How can they best serve the interests of their students at this point in the semester? And kind of what encouragement would you give to these instructors who really do want the best for their students? Yeah, and I think that's a place where the administration can step in um, and be mindful of the tremendous challenge uh, that shifting to online instruction is creating for instructors. Supporting, so it, I think one of the reasons that instructors have not been especially well prepared uh, to teach, to kind of do this rapid shift to online instruction is because online instruction has been sort of poo-pooed for years as, as sort of a, a lesser than uh, format of instruction. Um, but as we've seen, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of effort uh, 
uh, to create high quality content for students uh, in online courses. And it's possible to do, it is possible to create a highly effective online learning environment for students, but it takes far more work than just showing up in a classroom and talking for an hour and a half about a topic that you know a lot about. Uh, and, and learning new skills, putting in the time, reaching out to students, especially in such a traumatic moment, to check in on students and see how they're doing, and do that work to make flexible accommodations for students in need. I really think that the university has to be tremendously mindful right now of the added burden on instructors uh, and think about how do we potentially adjust expectations for things like research and for service, uh, for tenure, for hiring, for promotions, uh, to accommodate for and account for uh, the added burden that teaching online this semester um, and potentially into the future uh, is likely to create for instructors who've had to uh, massively retool their, um, their, their courses and then potentially also thinking about what are the ways to help those, especially if we're talking about um, faculty, but then also about graduate student instructors, how do we help them get back on track? Um, how do we then, uh, if they need to essentially focus so much of their energies and efforts on teaching in the short term, how do we then make sure that they have the time and the research support and the resources uh, to then get back on track with their research down the line as well? I wanna check in with Vanessa now and see how we're doing on time. So I think we have time for one more question. So this is a question that I've also wondered before. In uh, sociology classes in particular, we talk about inequality a lot. And we see this happening in a lot of um, classes in the colleges of arts and sciences. And so right now, we are probably encountering a number of students who are experiencing inequality at higher rates. And we've seen this happening since the pandemic started, especially. And so how can instructors be sensitive to these issues when they're talking about inequality in their classroom, knowing that a lot of their students are likely suffering from these issues. And this is something that you, um, particularly with your inequality research, but also talking about this digital divide, a lot of the students you might teach this to are experiencing it themselves. So how can we be sensitive to these issues and still teach students about them? Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, I think it's important to approach these discussions in a place that acknowledges the structural roots of inequality. Um, and that avoids blaming people who are the victims of structural inequalities for the challenges that they face. Uh, one of the, 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 the um, on the first day of my introduction to sociology class, um, I have students watch a, um, a PSA, a, a public service announcement video that was created by LeBron James um, that's a sort of a stay in school ad. Um, and it depicts uh, students um, failing to wake up in the morning, turning off his alarm and rolling over and going back to sleep. And then it depicts that student uh, later dropping out of high school and sort of ending up uh, sort of unemployed and, and, and in pretty desperate situations. And we talk about what does that ad imply about where uh, high school dropout comes from? Um, and what does it suggest about the source of those kinds of inequalities? And then I have my students brainstorm a list of what are some other possible reasons, uh, as, aside from just a lack of motivation or a lack of effort, uh, why students might ultimately end up not finishing high school? And they can fill a chalkboard uh, with all kinds of reasons, whether it's that they had a family member pass away or that they were uh, dealing with um, teen pregnancy or they were dealing with bullying or they were dealing with all sorts of issues that, that they had to uh, work uh, to be able to provide for their families who weren't able to make enough money to support their families themselves. Uh, so, or they had to help their younger siblings with homework after school, all sorts of, they can come up with all sorts of structural reasons uh, why someone might uh, not finish high school. And so then we talk about that in, in, in our sociology class about structural inequalities uh, or structure versus agency. And that so often when we talk about inequality in our society, we talk about it from an agency perspective, uh, where we say that, oh, if, if someone doesn't succeed in life, it's because they didn't work hard enough or they weren't the right kind of person uh, in order to be able to succeed. But when kind of given the opportunity, uh, helping students to recognize that the structural sources of inequalities instead, and so treating it not just as, uh, let's look at these differences across groups in some outcome, but let's take a step back and really try to understand where do those inequalities and outcomes come from? Um, and what are the kinds of systemic problems in our society, systemic um, class-based inequalities and racial inequalities and gender-based inequalities that can contribute to the kinds of unequal outcomes that we often see? I think essentially to get back to Maritza's question, it's, it's being cautious not to just talk about unequal outcomes, but to talk about the inequitable processes uh, that produce those unequal outcomes as well. So thank you so much.
um, to, uh, and actually, if it's okay, there is one more question in the chat that I would love to quickly address. Um, I think Tom had raised a question about the cost of education being too high as a return on investment. And I think one key thing to keep in mind uh, with that question, especially right now, is to understand why the cost of education is so high for students. Uh, and that really stems from the lack of federal investment and state investment uh, in higher education. Essentially what we've seen over the last 30, 30 or 40 years uh, is that states and federal governments have, have dramatically decreased the amount of funding that they provide to public universities like IU. And essentially what, they, what they're saying is that we should actually push a higher percentage of the costs of college onto students and families. Uh, the, the rhetoric around this often says that students are the ones who are benefiting from college and so they should be the ones who are paying for that degree. Uh, and so the vast, the vast proportion of the increased costs of tuition uh, come from the fact that the costs of providing college to students um, are no longer being pr provided primarily by taxpayers uh, the way that they were in even up through the the 1980s um, but are now being paid primarily by individual students and individual families instead and so it's not that the cost of providing college uh, or a college education has has gotten higher in many cases instead it's about sort of who's being expected to share those costs and so i think really if we want to both lower tuition and also be able to provide additional technological resources for students, the key here is really to demand that the federal government and state governments be willing to treat public education, public higher education as a public good uh, that students deserve for, uh, uh, that, that, that taxpayers should fund um, at least a, sub a substantially higher percentage of in order to make that as accessible for po as possible for students. So uh, with that, uh, I will turn things back over to, I will thank Marissa uh, for her help in fielding and, and summarizing these questions so nicely and thank all of you uh, for submitting these questions, uh, which were so thoughtful and engaging uh, and hopefully useful for you all to hear the answers to. Uh, and I will turn things back over to uh, Vanessa now to jump in with some announcements as well. Thank you so much. And thank you again for joining us and participating in this evening's live streaming event. Uh, I would also like to thank Professor Calarco and Ms. Steele for their time and expertise. We are grateful to you all. Finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support of donors who understand the value of a liberal arts education. If you would like to support the faculty, students, and programs of the College of Arts and Sciences, please consider making a gift to the Arts and Sciences Priority Fund at the Indiana University Foundation. Until next time, please take care and stay safe.